It's time for The Word with Pastor Tim Rigdon with The Well. This is a church digging a wellspring of revival in rural America. This is a place where you come as you are. You won't leave the same. Now, here is Pastor Tim Rigdon with today's message here on Sermons from the Well. Laboring into the new season. Amen. So sometimes when we go into a new season of life, we find ourselves getting weary because we've labored so much. Because we're so, uh, it's something new, we're, we're working things out so much. Uh, but to go into it, really, but, uh, this may be short and sweet. I've got some more for tonight that I want to release tonight But uh, to go with it. But uh, if we got your Bibles, turn to Colossians 3.23. It says, and whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto men. See, I've seen a lot of people work, and they're not working as though unto the Lord. Amen. They're working into themselves. Well, y'all quiet. Do y'all resemble that remark? (laughs) Listen, when we do anything, if we're going to uh, work or we're going to volunteer, we need to give our all for it, right? We don't need to do halfway, whatever. Uh, Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not grow weary while doing good. Amen? Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, everybody say due season. How many knows you're due a season? Amen? That's the word Kairos right there. The time of God and the destiny of God coming together. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart, or if we do not lose heart. And that's what I found with people. They'll serve the Lord, and they'll be going through a and needing a breakthrough or a miracle or whatever. But it's like it, we give up right before. And he said, don't grow weary in doing this. Because our due season is coming. Amen. How many knows your due season is coming? And it says, you shall reap if you faint not. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 in the New King James says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your labor is not in vain, and the, your labor in the Lord is not in vain, <clears throat> and that's where the Lord started giving me this: that too many people are laboring, and you're laboring because you're in a new season. And when we get into new season, sometimes we don't know what we're supposed to do or what it's supposed to look like, and it looks different. And a lot of people are in a new season. In fact, I think most of us are. Our church even is. Amen? It's in a new season. And so you feel like, well, I need to labor. I need to do something to make this thing operate. Now, I want to read that same scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, from the Passion. Listen to this. So now, beloved ones, stand firm and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence. Listen to this next line. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord. Amen? We prosper and excel in every season serving the Lord because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our our labor productive with fruit that endures. Amen? And the Bible says that that he told them, he said, I want you to bear much fruit and that your fruit remain. Amen? I I feel like a lot of times we, we have some fruit and we'll see some fruit but we won't see remaining fruit. Amen? Remaining fruit is when things have been around for a while. But I want to focus in on that one scripture, that one part of the scripture says, we know that we prosper and then we excel in every season by serving the Lord. So I don't care what season you're in. You could be in a good season. You could be in a bad season. The Lord said in his word right here, you're going to prosper and you're going to excel in that season regardless of what it looks like right now. Amen? Now, I got this example, and I wanted to, uh, and it's going to seem foolish to you, but I, but it, you're going to remember it. You can hand me that coat, baby. This is a coat that I bought. Believe it or not, it's in great shape. I bought this thing. This coat's over 30 years old. I bought this before I even moved to Kentucky when I skied, and I haven't skied since I'm right out of high school, so that shows you <laughs> I remember where I bought it. I bought it down in Pigeon Forge at one of those outlet malls. And, so, and uh, it's a true goose down jacket. Now, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, I just haven't skied since I've been to Kentucky 28 and a half years. And so, uh, 
But I'm going to put it on because I want you to see something. It's not about how old I've had, had this thing. It's a big old puffy thing, too. Plus, I feel like that. Uh, yeah, she's worried. I, had, uh, I can't. It gets me too hot. But I feel like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. You know? <laughs> In it. But uh, here, here's the thing I want you to see about this. You see this ski jacket? I've had it for many years. I used to snow ski quite often, so that's the reason I got it. I can't remember the last time I even wore it. And I probably not even wore it since I moved to Kentucky. So it's been a long time between times. Amen? And I know for a fact that I've not worn this jacket this summer. And I know I didn't wear it last week especially. <laughs> Thank God we're through that time. <clears throat> But you know why I didn't wear this coat this summer or last week? Because this was not meant for this season. Too many times we're wearing stuff in a new season in life that we're not called to wear in this season. This is not meant for this season of, in the natural. And I think that so many times people bring things from a past season into their new season and you, don't, and you wonder why it's not working now. Because it was not meant for that season. <clears throat> Just because you've used or even needed something in a prior season, and it doesn't mean it's needed in this season. See, <clears throat> I'm getting hot in this coat already. I'm getting hot. I'm, thank God you ain't close enough to it. I'm probably starting to sweat some. And when I start to get hot and sweaty, you know, uh, you get a little stressed out about things. Amen? Same is as when you're not seeing victory or the promise in this season of your life. When you don't see the victory, when it don't look like it's anywhere close to being a breakthrough or a miracle begin to happen, when you don't see the promises that God said in this season, then we too get a little hot and bothered. Sometimes we get a little stressed out about things. Sometimes we get to worrying about things. Sometimes we're stressing over and overheating in this season. But why are we doing that? It's because, because we're trying to use something from a past season that doesn't work very well in this season that we were not called to use during this season. We've, we've brought things in from another season. The biggest, <laughs> here's the thing. Some of us just need to take some things off. This morning you need to drop, you need to just take it off because you've been wearing stress, you've been wearing fear, you've been wearing disappointment, discouragement, all these different things. You're carrying around things from a previous season. Some of you are carrying around hurts that you had in a past season. Some are carrying around disappointments from a past season. Some are carrying around discouragement from a past season. And even some of you have looked at this new season that you're in and you said, well, here we go again. Hallelujah. That's because you need to take some things off. You need to take off that fear that tries to encompass you. That fear that tries to grab a hold of your heart and your mind. That, that disappointment, that worry, that stress that keeps you up at night. It's because we've been wearing it for so long that we've got comfortable in something that wasn't meant for this season. Amen. We've got comfortable with, from something that was not given from God, but it was given from the enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why there's an old saying. It said the biggest hindrance to a new move of God is the old move. In other words, we think we did it this way way back when. And I just told you that was over 30 years old, that coat. I can look back at when we began this church. Amen? When we first started this church and the, the vision that God gave us and stuff, we ain't doing things like we used to do it. And see, sometimes that makes somebody uncomfortable, upset. When you start doing a new thing, when you start doing it a different way than you used to do it, then all of a sudden, well, I liked it better the old way. Yeah, but God's saying, I want to do something new in your life. You've held on to the old, you've held on to that old coat, and you've wore that religious coat for 30 years, but it's time to lay it down because God said, I'm doing a new thing. Amen. I'm wanting to do something new in your life. Hallelujah. 
Some are carrying around all these different things. Many are trying to discern your present time, the, the present season you're in, by your experiences from a prior season. You're trying to discern your present. In other words, what do I need to do in this season? By your experience of what I, and I know God gives us some experience, and, and I know experience speaks uh, volumes when you're dealing with somebody, with situation, with life in general and stuff. But I'm, you know what experience does? Experience causes you to depend upon yourself rather than upon him. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downing experience. I, I thank God for the experiences I've had in my life. But I want to tell you something. I don't want my experience to get in the way of what the Lord wants to do in my life. I don't want the experiences that we had uh, 28 and a half years ago or, or 30 or 5 or 10 or, let me put it, three years ago. We had a move of God started about three years ago. Y'all remember it? It started at a birthday party down in Sturgis. And see, if we're not careful, we try to recreate what happened. And when we try to recreate it, we put back on a code of religion that thank God what God did back then. But I want to see what God wants to do today. Amen. Amen. I thank God for the heritage of faith. I thank God I've seen angels. I've seen the dead raids. I've seen all these things. But guess what? I want to see what God has planned for today. Or if he tarries next week or the week after. I've seen these things and I've experienced these things. And I thank God for them. But I don't want that to stand in the way of what God wants to do now. We serve a now God because we want him to be an on-time God. He's not on time a lot of times because we're still wearing the, what yesterday's move of God was. And we're still saying, God, you got to do it that way. Now, what songs did we sing? What did we do? i tell you what we did. We filled up a baptistry, uh, the baptistry. <clears throat> and we continued to do that. We, uh, I mean, Peachy was over yesterday and uh, whatever. But I'm telling you, as I've told so many, that's just Sturgis tap water. And when you make it a religious act, when you make it that old coat, well, we've seen God heal this way. We've seen God do this, this way. Praise God for that. But what if God don't want to ever do that way again? Will we hang on to the old ways so much that we'll never see God do something again because we're so caught up in the way he used to do it or the way he did it once upon a time? Too many people, even, even with myself and what I went through the past year, you know, I've had people say, well, you don't preach like you used to. Thank God. Thank God. I hope there's more depth because I'm sitting around thinking about the Lord. I don't have nothing else going on, so I might as well think about it. You know what I'm saying? I hope there's more depth. I hope there's, and that's not saying that, that those things were shallow or anything like that. I'm not saying it. But I want what God's doing now. I want what God's doing now. And if God wants me to stand on my head, I'll stand on my head. <clears throat> You'll definitely have to help me do that. <clears throat> it's hard enough to stand on my feet sometimes. <laughs> but, I'll, but let me tell you something. Do not let your past victories stand in the way of the victory that God wants to give you today. That's what I see so many people doing. And see, we see this in religion, and we say in these old churches, or we say it's old-time revival or old-time religion, and we always want to point to the little church down the street or that one over there or that one out in the country. Uh, they, they're caught up in the old ways of doing. Well, you should learn from them. But I believe our old ways can be what God did last week. Behold, it's a new day. It's a new day. He wants to do a new thing. Many are trying to discern your present season by the natural experiences you had from another season. Isaiah 4, 43, verse 19 says this, Behold, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring up, spring forth. Shall you know it? He asked a question, shall you know it? Why would he ask, shall you know it? Because if you're still looking at the old way he did things, an old jacket, and you say, well, I believe God can move in the old ways. I do, too. I believe God is God, and he can do anything he wants to. But I'm telling you that if we say that is the only way, and we've, we've constricted the way that God can move, we've hindered God, we put God in the box. 
And I want to open up the box today. I want to remind you that he's God and he can do anything he wants to, any way he wants to. Now, I'm not telling you nothing you don't know, but sometimes we need to be reminded of this so that we don't get caught up in the trap. What's the trap? The trap is to put God in a box and say, this is the way he moved back when. This is the way he moved back then. So this is the way he's going to move now. He can still move that way. But why not say, God, I'm tearing up my box. I'm busting my box, and you can do anything you want to do. Any way you want to do it. It takes a lot more faith to believe God can do something in a way that he's never done it before. Hallelujah. That it does to, you know why we want him to do it the way we, he's done it before? Because we're familiar with that way. We're comfortable with that way. That don't move us outside of our comfort zone. Well, what if the Spirit of God just fell into place so much that the priest couldn't minister, the Shekinah glory cloud filled up, and all we could do is wail at the altar? That would make a lot of people in here uncomfortable. Uh, it's got quiet, but it would make a lot. But what if God wants to do that? What if God wants to break you right in front of God and everybody else? I'm reminded, uh, Don Tribble took me to St. Louis one time when I, I first got to Kentucky. Uh, what was that guy's name? It, Rodney Howard Brown. He kept, this is when he was just getting popular, and he said, man, you need to go down there. I said, I don't know. And I was very skeptical. I was very skeptical of the, the laughing and stuff like that. We get down there, they, they were giving, having this video of the... You know, and all these different things, and people were laughing, and then it stopped. He was up, and he wanted to do a video about starving kids somewhere in Africa or somewhere. You know, and I'm sitting there in a big auditorium, life center. I don't know how many seat, <coughs> but I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm so judgmental. Okay, I'm I'm being transparent today. <coughs> I was in, and I'm saying, God, I don't believe this stuff. I don't like his stuff. And even though Don had told me about it, and he'd, he'd said, I was still, I went because of my relationship with, with Don. But I was sitting there thinking, and they're playing a video about some kids, you know, and everybody's quiet and stuff. You know what the Lord does? He said, show me how real he is. Right in front of thousands of people. Not in an opportune moment. Not when everybody else is laughing. It hit me. And I'm like, oh, God, no, no, no. I am, you can hear me across the congregation. <laughs> and I got so embarrassed. I was laughing so hard, I crawled up under the seat. They're taking up an offering for starving kids, and I'm laughing. It, it, it was bad. I was like, but you know why God did that? He wanted to prove to me, I'm God, and I can do anything I want to anytime I want to. And you may not believe in that move of God or this move of God, and I didn't. I was very skeptical. But God showed me he's God, and he can do anything he wants to. He made a donkey speak, did he not? And he does it about every Sunday morning. Uh, I is one, so I can talk about one. <clears throat> Amen. But in that, you know, God didn't let me just go along with the crowd. He pointed me out. He picked me out. I was the only one laughing. And I could not stop. And I'm like, and I don't do that. I mean, and I especially didn't do it then because I was like, I don't believe in this. I'm not sure this is even real. This is a blasphemy. And the next thing I know, I'm under a chair laughing my head off with starving kids. <laughs> and they're taking up an offering. I mean, it was, not, it was a very solemn time. It was not a time to be laughing. But Lord put holy laughter on me that morning. <clears throat> Amen. And I can't say it's come on me that often. And <clears throat> but when it does, or I see somebody else, it's it's funny to me. People can cry, people can shout, people can run, people can dance. Don't bother the doll, but somebody start laughing in church. It raises every religious spirit there is. Because why? 
because we've been taught you don't do that. But yet at the same time, the Scripture says joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I'm not saying that so we can all start laughing today, okay? <clears throat> Matter of fact, our oldest son, when he got saved, he thought something was wrong with him, but he started laughing. He's 16 years old. Yeah, he said he couldn't stop. And it's that joy and speak with just boiling out of your spirit. And the Bible says that laughter does a body good like a medicine. What if God wanted to heal you, but before he healed you, he wanted to, well, <clears throat> I, have you got God in such a box that he can't do, but unless he does it the way you want it to? I remember uh, Pastor Keith's dad, Pastor Larry Nix, blowed my mind. And uh, me and Brother Keith, we came up underneath his dad. Of course, him more than not me, but he was a mentor to me. And <clears throat> I can remember this lady coming down there, and she could They got her up out of the wheelchair, come down for it, because I go there on Sunday nights. And on Sunday nights, angels would begin. People saw, I didn't see them, but people saw angels walking up down the aisles. This church in Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm, and I'm sitting there, you know, and I was up on a piano or something, but I seen him get this woman up out of a, 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 a wheelchair, <clears throat> and she's sitting there, and I mean, they wheeled her in. And she's sitting there like that, <clears throat> and brother, and of course she wants healing. So brother Larry goes around to her, to behind her, sticks his knee up in her back. And just pulls her shoulder, and it popped like a shotgun. And then next thing you know, she's dancing all over the place, running. She's running all over the place saying, God, heal, God, heal me. Now, that was not something I expected to see that night. That the man of God just grabbed a hold of a woman, stuck her knee in his back, popped it right there in front of God. And I'm like, I, I ain't seen that before. But you know what? It doesn't matter if God healed that person. If he's just being obedient. Do you know he got a phone call the next day from that woman? And she was complaining to him and raking him over the coals. Said, you made a fool out of me. And she said all this. You know, you put your knee up there. You, the way you did that, you made a fool. Do you know that woman was not just back in a wheelchair, was in a, a hospital bed the rest of her days? See, so many times we complain about how God does something. When God says, you know what, I want to do something new. <clears throat> and so I started, I started asking the Lord, I said, what's the new thing look like? I don't care. So you know it, it will make a road in the wilderness and a, de a river in the desert. How many feel like that you've been going through a, a wilderness time? I mean, it feels like you've been in a desert dry place. God said, I'm going to make a river there, and I'm going to make a road or a way to get through that wilderness. Not get you out, but get you through it. So when you come out the other side, you're going to have victory. Amen? So he said, I'm going to do this. And so I asked the Lord about it in this new season. I said, what's the new thing in the new season? How I know it's you. And this is what he told me. I said, what are you going to do, Lord, in this new season? Of the well. What are you going to do in this new season of Pastor Tim and Bar? What are you going to do in my family? What are you going to? And this is what I heard the Lord say. This is the whisper. I'm going to do what I've not seen and never not heard. I'm going to do something you ain't never saw before. And I'm going to let you hear something you ain't never heard before. It'll always line up with His Word. Amen. And you think because I told those stories that those are weird stories and those are out of the ordinary? Go, go read your Bible. <laughs> How about the prophet? He said, I want you to lay on your left side for six months. Now I want you to, what do I do now, Lord? I want you to turn over and lay on your right side for six months. You know, that stuff would freak us out anymore. You know, what if God really showed up like he wanted to, and he did what he wanted to do in our lives? Would we reject it because it don't line up with my experience. Will we reject the move of God? Will we reject the presence of God because it don't line up with my past religious experiences? 
But yet God's saying, I want to do something new in you. Amen? Sis, I think there's something God's doing new. Even, even when you come up here to this microphone, because I've known you for several years, that is not you. When you get up in front of, and you just start whipping, you know what? God's doing something new. He's taking what the enemy's trying to make a stony, hard heart, and God said, I'm making it soft and pliable, and I'm going to, you're going to find it's not going to be just up there. You're going to be talking to people, and you don't know why. You, God said, I'm making you a weeping prophet. <laughs> Amen. That you're going to find times that I don't even know how to, I don't even know if I need to, need to say this, but you're going to begin to talk to people, and they're going to see your heart break before their eyes. And because of that, they're going to know that it's the Lord. They're going to know it's the Lord. Now, see, that ain't comfortable, but yet, if it changes somebody's life, amen? It's not about us. It's, I was down there at uh, Potter's Hope this past week uh, preaching, and I told him the word, and I'll remind you if I haven't, if you, you know all this. But the Lord told me, he said, when I get that one person in front of me, that at that time, he's going to do a healing. Now, when you think about that, and, and, and I told him, I said, the one may be here tonight. I don't know. But in order for that to manifest the way, i got to realize something. It ain't about me. It ain't even about my healing. It's about what they're going to do with what they see. It's about that one person. It's not about me. Most of the time, if you're a born-again Christian and you've matured it all in your walk with God, stuff that happens is not about you. It's about somebody else. Somebody else needs to see you walk in faith. Somebody else needs you to be broken before the Lord. Somebody else needs you to do what only God could do through you. Amen? Because the world is waiting. Hallelujah. I got to get it from up here. Y'all remember that old uh, TV show, Truth or Consequences? Does anybody remember that? Okay, I can tell everybody that's over 50. Remember they bring somebody out, that, and then they had, three, they had one contestant, and they had three people that was kind of around the stage, and they all said they were a certain person. But at the end, and this is what I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying to us today, at the end, well, whoever their name is, let's, let's just say they're John Doe, would the true John Doe please stand up? I believe the Lord sent that to the church. I'm not, not just this church, the church around the world. Would my true blood-bought church please stand up? Would you stand up and take a stand? Will you take a stand, or are you fearful still? Well, it's time for us to stand. It's time for us to stand up. I'm not talking about being... Uh, politically correct or whatever i'm saying being biblically correct <laughs> i'm not talking about taking a stand just so you can be argumentable what i'm saying is will you be real see romans 8 18 says says all of creation stand on tiptoe waiting for the true revealing of the true sons and daughters of god true sons and daughters of god that's what god's looking for He's looking for his children to rise up and maturely and to grow and to be revealed. Because I want to tell you something. Just because you wear the tag Christian, just because you, 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 you checked the box and said, I went to church today, that did not make you right with God. Amen. We're only right with God and right standing with God because of our relationship with him. Amen. It's not just about you knowing Jesus, but Jesus knowing you. Amen? I'm his and he is mine. Amen? There's a lot of people, I could say it, in a, everybody in the sound of my voice, everybody watching online, you say, I know Jesus, but does Jesus know you? Does Jesus know you? Do you have a relationship? See, when my, way before uh, this uh, caller ID on our cell phones and stuff, <clears throat> way before that happened, she could call me. I knew who it was. I didn't have to look at my phone. I didn't have to look at the caller ID. Is that my wife? No, I knew it was her every time. Not because she told me, not because, but because I had a relationship with her. Many of you, you say, well, 
You say you hear the voice of the Lord. He says, my sheep know my voice and will not listen to a stranger. Many of you say you hear from the Lord, and then people want to doubt you, and they say, well, the Lord's never talked to me. Maybe it's because you've never listened or you're not his. I ain't saying you are or you ain't. I'm just saying maybe you need to go past a religion or a religious experience, and you need to go into a relationship. Why are you here today? You hear out of, so you don't have guilt or shame. Well, like I told them uh, Wednesday night, I said when I was younger, I had a real bad drug problem. I got drugged every church service coming and going. You know, and maybe you're here today because your parents drugged you, or your wife drugged you, or your girlfriend or your or your husband drugged you, or your boyfriend drugged you. That may be your case. Guess what? You're not here by chance. You're here by a divine ordeal of the Lord. You've got to know that this is ordained of God. Why? Because God wants to get a hold of you tonight or this morning. He wants to get a hold of you. You've got a hold of him, and you go to him when you need him to do something. You've went to him and said, Lord, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And we've had our laundry list of things we wanted the Lord to do. But the Lord says this to you. I want you. I want you to want me not because of what I can do for you. Hallelujah. But just because you love me. I remember one of the the greatest times of being a parent was one time I I had my man man cave I'd made over there. And I remember it was getting close to Christmas time, you know, and your kids, they start acting better at Christmas. I didn't say that, but anyway. <laughs> well, anyway, Colton wanted to climb up my lap. I was in my recliner, and he climbed up my lap, and he put his arms around my neck, and he kissed me. He said, Dad, I love you, and I said, I love you too, son. What do you want? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a natural reaction, especially as young as he was. <laughs> and he said, I don't want nothing. I said, you sure? You don't want a dirt bike? You don't want, he goes, I do, but that ain't the reason I'm here today. I just want to tell you I love you. When's the last time we went to Jesus or went to God and just crawled up in Daddy God's lap and said, I didn't come today to get something. I didn't come today to ask something. I just come to love on you. I didn't come for what you could do for me. I didn't come for what you had done for me in the past. And I thank you for all those things, but today, I'm just coming to you, Lord, because I love you. I love you, and I just want to show you I love you. Father God, I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you that you spared my life. I thank you for I could spend the rest of my days thanking him for things. But today, it ain't just me thanking you. Today, it's not me asking for anything. Today, it's just me saying, I love you. I love you. And I don't need nothing. I'm not wanting nothing. Oh, there's things. I have a list just like everybody else does. But today I ain't bragging at my list. Today it's just me and him. When can you say that? Now, it don't have to be on Sunday. It could be tomorrow. It could be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It could be any day. But I encourage you more times than not, go to the Lord and don't ask him anything. I just come to love on you today. I just come to... Let me say this too. If the only time you read your Bible is when you're in church or you're in a class, if the only time you worship, if the only time you tell the Lord you love Him is when you get in here, it's not much of a relationship, is it? What if I told my wife the only time I told her I loved her was when we went to church on Sunday morning. Say what? I know I wired out. I? I'll quit. <laughs> I didn't think so. <clears throat> There's certain things, and husbands, if you don't do this to your wives, take note, okay? Because I know this is from the Lord. I tell her, not once, not twice, but she said 20 times a day that I love her. I never fail. One of the first things I do in the morning is tell her I love you. 
Secondly, I tell you what, how beautiful you are every day. You know what? I tell her before she's got her makeup on. I tell her when she's still got the moo-moo on. But I, I do that. I don't do that because I'm wanting something. I don't do that because I, I need to get something. I do that because I love that woman. And if I do that for her, how much more should I do for my Heavenly Father? That's the reason every morning when I'm waking up, I may not even be up where everybody can see me. I'm like, I love you, Lord. Thank you for waking me up again. Lord, I give you glory. Let my life today be a glorify, glorify you, your life. Amen. Every day. Every day. But I'm running behind by work, which is more important. You're a little late for work or you give him praise and you love on him. Now, I'm not justifying, here we are, Labor Day and all that and stuff. I'm not justifying being late. You say, well, I, can't, I don't have time to do that. Aren't you glad he took the time for you, though? Hallelujah. Amen. This is about relationship. And guess what? Me loving her is not hard. It's not a labor. Me loving him is not hard, and it's, it's not a labor. And it's not just what he's done for me. Oh, I could love him for that alone. See, too many people, we love Jesus and we love God for what they did for us or what they're going to do for us. What if they don't do nothing else? Amen. Wait to your face. And see, I had to come to this realization. I, I believe God's going to heal me on this side of glory. Okay? But here's the thing. Even if he don't, I'm going to love him. And I'm going to praise him and I'm going to be thankful for him. Even if God didn't answer your prayer or you didn't get your miracle, or your breakthrough that you wanted on this side of heaven, are you still going to love him? Oh, yeah, you're in church right now. You're going to say, yeah, and nod your head back. I'm talking about when you go out and you're back facing that situation. See, this is safe right here. But I'm talking about when nobody else knows, when you go back out and you face what you're facing. When you go home alone or it's late at night and you're laying there in the bed and you're thinking about things, are you going to love him still? Are you going to praise him still? Or are you going to get back out your list again? See, God ain't Santa Claus. Well, we just, in other words, I want you to crawl up in, the, in his lap this week and just say, I don't need nothing, Lord, except you. I'm loving on you today. I dare you to do a whole day of just that. Don't ask the Lord for anything. Don't, especially for yourself. Now, you can pray for other people if they call you. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying for yourself. Something that benefits you. Take one day. It might be a new fast, wouldn't it? I'm fasting from asking. I'm fasting from asking because I'm getting to a place that I'm just thankful that I'm his. Relationship. Relationship. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, and it's talking about the, the, the disciples, it said, are these not ignorant, unlearned men? Uh, it's pretty blunt saying it when the King James Version. Ignorant, unlearned men. But it didn't stop there. It had a comma. We talked about commas yesterday, but how they changed things. It didn't finish it. It said, are these not ignorant, unlearned men, comma? But you could tell they've been with Jesus. But you could tell them, but. A but always changes everything. But God. But I could tell them that they've been with Jesus. Can people tell you've been hanging out with Jesus? Or did they tell you've been hanging out with somebody else? Because <clears throat> there's too many Christians who become chameleon Christians that you're a Christian, you're, man, you're shouting the house down and got your hands up, especially when the lights go down. But then when the lights come up and you go back out into the world, do you act like the people at work? Do you act like the people even in our homes sometimes? Or do we say, Lord, you know, that ain't me. Behold, all things have become new. That person's dead. And I'm living a new, I'm a new creature with new features. 
I challenge you this week. Spend a day of just loving on him. Fast for mask. Amen? And spend a day loving on him. It'll change your life. It'll change you. It'll change you to the point that people are going to say, man, there's something different about you. Oh, really? I'll tell you what. I've been hanging out with Jesus more. Didn't hang out with him what he could do for me. Didn't hang out because I had my laundry, laundry list of things I need him to do. I just hung out with him. It'll change your life. Amen. This new season that the church is entered into, when I say the church, I'm not just talking about this in this physical building. I'm talking about the, the church of the living God. I'm talking about we are the church. So it's each individual person. This new season, don't get caught up in laboring. Get caught up in loving. Love conquers all. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love changes things. And I'm not just talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. I'm talking about love the Lord thy God with all your might, with all your, you know, all your spirit. You need to get to the, back to that. You say, well, that's basics, Pastor. Yes, it's basics that the church has got away from. <clears throat> the church has got away from. And we've used the offering plates as like a gumball machine. We look, when I was a kid, I'd look at a gumball machine. I'd always find that one in there, the color that I wanted. I don't know that they actually were different flavors. They just different colors. <clears throat> but I'd find that one, and I'd stick my money in. If I didn't get it, if I had enough money or my mom or dad or grandparents would give me more, <clears throat> I'd stick it in and keep twisting it until I got out what I wanted. Amen. <clears throat> And that's the way we are with church. We come forward, we take our tithes, maybe we put a little extra in there as an offering because we want to twist on the God and believe Him for something to come out. It's what we wanted. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Bible says, taste and see if the Lord is good. I'm going to tell you, He's good already. He's so good to us. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what you're going through, but guess what? He's still good. We're all facing different things. We all deal with situations. Some of you, you've had to deal with uh, tragedy in your lives. Some of you with loss. Even, even uh, our family, you know, I had my stepfather passed away uh, two or three weeks ago. Then here's a, a man who was like Pastor Barb's father, passed away. You know, we can whine and cry and lick our wounds. And I'm not saying don't cry for because you're mourning for a person. What I'm si saying is in front of people, we ain't going to sit around licking our wounds because you know what? I know where both of them are. Because the Bible said once they left that body, they be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. And they're better off than I am. They're better off than you are. Amen. Yes, we will miss them and all that. But you may have faced some of these situations. But I'm going to tell you, his love and you loving on him is going to change everything. Amen. And I'm not telling you something that I wasn't doing already or we weren't doing already. What I'm telling you is you can never love him too much. You can never spend too much time with him. Amen. Because he's, he's wanting to get you from this in this new season that you don't fall into laboring. Amen. That you produce. <clears throat> and I'll tell you this. I haven't got the scripture back there, but Mark 11, 12 through 14 says, uh, this is Jesus, <laughs> says, Now the next day when they came out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps it would have find something on it. When he came to it, he only found leaves. He found nothing but leaves. For it, Now look, listen to this scripture. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Is that not, you know, when I read that scripture originally years ago, I thought that's one of the meanest scriptures. Jesus went up and cursed a fig tree when it wasn't even time for the figs to be on the tree. Amen. <clears throat> let me tell you what, what the Lord showed me. He said, when my son comes on the scene, I don't care what season you are in your life, you're going to produce fruit. You're going to produce fruit, not because it's your season to produce, but because he's here. So if, he, if you've had a, an encounter with Jesus 
and you properly discern that, I don't care what season of your life you're in, you'll still produce fruit. You'll still produce. I don't care if it's a new season. I don't care if it's a bad season or it's a rough season or it's, it's, and it's been tough. I ain't denying any of those things. But here's the thing. You still need to produce. You produce fruit. You produce fruit and much fruit that your fruit remain. I believe that sometimes it's when I'm in the valley seasons that I produce the most fruit. We don't like that, but that's the way it is. Now, see, I'm from the mountains of North Carolina, so up there there's a lot of mountains. And, uh, you know, like here, they've been starting this week, I've been harvesting all the beans and the corn. And I see these big combines, and I met a bunch of them down the road and stuff. And you see the fields. There's some fields even in Sturgis. There's more, I believe there's more corn planted in Sturgis in Union County than there is in the whole county or that I grew up in because we don't have those big fields. So when somebody's going to plant a garden, we don't go up on the parkway to the highest point because it's not fertile sound, uh, ground up there. We go down into the valley. That's where the fertile soil is. It's because the rains come. And the wind, you know, all these things, it washes down and it makes the bottom land or the, the, the valley the most fertile. I believe that to be true in our own lives. If we just live from mountaintop to mountaintop and we never go through any valleys, we're never going to produce the fruit that has any value. My stepfather, he was a logger once upon that before he passed away. And I asked him one time, I said, Man, there's a bunch of big trees up there that y'all left. I said, why'd you leave them? He says, you always leave above a certain elevation except toward the top of the mountain. I don't care how big the tree is. I said, why'd you leave them? There's some of them trees. Man, they look like they'd be worth thousands of dollars. He said, yeah, but every one of those trees, when you cut it down, you realize the heart is rotten. The inside is hollow or rotten. And I've seen that to be with people. Everybody that, if you go through somebody who everything's always hunky-dory and everything, and they never go through any trials, they never go through some valleys, if once they face it and you look inside, it's really their heart has a problem. Amen. Don't think just because you're going through something that you're not in God's will. See, that's the number one lie the enemy wants to say is, if I'm going through this, it must be because I've done something wrong. Sometimes it's because he did something right. So I want you to encounter Jesus in a new way this way, this week. We need to produce fruit, church. I don't care what season we're in. Devil don't want me to say this, Mark. Whatever season you're in, I don't care if you're 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 struggling with a physical thing in the season, or it's a mental thing or a financial thing or whatever it is. Produce the fruit that God's called you to produce. You're in a season, and you're not going to produce that fruit if you don't have a relationship with Him. You understand? It boils down to this: the people want what you got. Do people want what you got? Because if they don't, then we need to be down to order checking ourselves. Amen. You've been listening to Sermons from the Well with Pastor Tim Rigdon. Subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get fresh new weekly episodes. For more, please visit our website at www.thewell.live. Until next time, come as you are. You won't leave the same.